John 17, we're going to be covering from verse 6 through verse 16. You got to remember, this is the Lord's Prayer. Jesus is talking to the Father, really, really praying to Him. And you got to keep that in mind as we go through this. Imagine hearing Jesus pray. Amazing, right? And He prayed in such a way that the disciples would hear. It's kind of like He was praying over His shoulder so that his disciples would hear. He wants to encourage his disciples because he's about to be betrayed. He's about to leave them. He's already told them. And he knows that he's leaving. And the disciples have been with him all this time. He's protected them. He's loved them. And so he's leaving. And so now he's uh, praying to God the Father. And we saw that the first, six verse, the first five verses of John 17, Jesus is saying, okay, I'm going to accomplish this great thing that you've sent me to do. And um, it's going to take everything. It's going to take my life. I'm going to taste all the sins of all time, the most vile, ugly sins of the whole world of whole time. I'm going to take them on myself. And not only am I going to taste the vileness of all the sin, and you and I can get a taste of the vileness of sin when we have sinned or somebody has sinned against us. And he's going to take it all. You can, I mean, it's just mind-blowing. It's beyond anything we can even think of. And not only is he going to take all the vileness of all sin, of all time, of all humanity, he also is going to receive the punishment that all those sins and all that vileness of all time, he's going to take it. The wrath of the Father being poured to judge the sins of the world. And so with that, he says, Father, I need you like never before. I, want, I need your presence. I need your empowering connection, Father, as I go through this. Those are the first five verses that he's praying to the Father. And he says at the very beginning, uh, verse 1, Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven. I mean, this is the most awesome, awesome prayer. And that's what we're coming here. We covered the first five verses the last time. Now what follows. And really what follows is the continued revelation of the heart of Jesus. His heart is for love. And we need to ask the question, you know, how are we doing with love? Are we being moved by love? Now, we started this church in 1987, and in these years, we've gone through many ups and downs, many, many heartaches, many heartaches, and many joys as well. I mean, great things that we have seen God at work. And because of that, those of us that have been here a long time and seen the ups and downs, we've grown in our love for one another. This community has become a loving community that can help others, right? And it's wonderful to experience that love. It's powerful. Uh, and that's just a, a human community. And uh, difficulties and victories uh, produce that community, community of love, right? And that's really what God wants, by the way. That's what God wants. To develop a community full of love that have gone through, through heartaches and victories together. In fact, uh, in the middle of all that, the love of God is there. If you want to turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John, not the Gospel of John. We're in the Gospel of John. But turn to 1 John chapter 1. And I want you to note... Uh, John, the gospel writer, which is the same one that wrote the gospel of John, is the same one that wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But I want you to see here what he's after. And he says, 1st John chapter 1 and verse 1, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, 
what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. In other words, what we, what we experienced, we heard, we saw, we touched this word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen, and he kind of repeats it, and testify, proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard proclaimed to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made full, may be made complete. John is saying, what we experience, I want you to experience. Because God is so awesome. You see, John knew the love of Jesus Christ. The love of the Father. And he says, mm, we want you to experience that. And that's what God wants. Um, in my own life, uh, I've experienced the love of God at, at some level, right? But there are moments that are especially, especially powerful. They're not that often. I wish they were. But when they're there, I remember them. And they have kept me going for years without experiencing those moments constantly. They are so powerful. And you and I can relate to that at some level. If we've ever been with a person or we're in love with a person and we're only able to be with them and we, we, we experience that love, it's like, oh yes, and we remember, and that kind of keeps us going. You see. Well, we need to have that about God. God's love towards us. Because that's what's going to keep us going. That's what gives nourishment to our soul. And when we see here Jesus in John 17 praying, we see his love, his heart for his, his disciples. It's awesome, awesome. But we have to ask of ourselves. Have we experienced the love of God? Now, we may have it intellectually, right? We all know, for God so loved the world. And we've repented and we've trusted in Jesus and we know him at some level. We know the love of God. But is it something that moves us day after day? That there is a powerful sense of the, of the throbbing love of God for each one of us? Because that's what God wants. Uh, does the love of God really move you? Or is it just an intellectual knowledge that you have about the love of God? It's a big question. And what we find in John 17 is this continued prayer that Jesus is talking to the Father. And what we find in these verses, verses 6 through 16, is this. That Jesus' loving heart is revealed when he shares joy with the Father. Here in these verses, he, man, he's like, Father, man, this is so awesome, Father. He's sharing his joy with the Father. And he prays for his disciples. The first five verses was really about Jesus. Hey, hey Father, I, I need this connection with you so I can pass on this eternal life because, man, he's going to take everything. He's going to take my life. Right? And now he focuses from not from himself, but to the disciples. And the first thing, and remember, the disciples are hearing this. The disciples are hearing this, and they need to see the relationship of Jesus with his Father. And so, verse 6, 7, and 8, Jesus is basically saying, impossible mission accomplished. <laughs> Impossible mission accomplished, verses 6, 7, and 8. Verse 9 and 10, we see the Father and Son working together. And Jesus brings this out. And the disciples are the special 
uh, objects of his love. You see, believers are the special objects of God's love. And you and I need to know that. Because if we don't know that, we're going to be going by our own steam. We're going to be going by our own limited, fallen emotions and will and everything. That's all we have. You see, we need to know how the Father and Son are working and we are special objects of His love. And so then verses 11 through 16, Jesus prays, prays for nourishment and protection of His disciples. And we're going to see why. So here we go. Uh, starting in verse 6. Uh, the name of God, um, God, many, many in the world use it, right? God is kind of like obscure, kind of like big, yeah, God. But in Jesus, the specific character of God is brought out, you see. And that's what we need to know about God, the specific character of who he is. He. Who is he? What is he like? And in Jesus, we find that, that he is uh, self-revealing. He's constantly reaching out. Look, this is who I am. This is who I am. This is who I am. Well, sometimes we, most of the time, we don't want to listen, but he's revealing himself because that's what we need. We find that he reconciles the, the world to himself, that he is loving that he is sovereign, that he cares. And that's what we find in the person of Jesus who reveals God the Father. And so he says in verse 6, I have manifested your name. I have revealed who you are, God. You're no longer this God nebulous, may the force be with you type of thing. You know? No. And what we summarize it as is God is Father. A caring, loving, all-powerful Father. And if we dig sometimes right below the surface in our own lives, we know the weightiness of a Father in our lives. It might be lacking, it might be that we had a terrible father, a loving father, a hardworking father, but distant, and we have all these images of who father is. But we know that being a father is something very, very powerful. And so Jesus says, um, uh, I have manifested your name to the men who you gave to uh, me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. So, right off the bat, Jesus is saying, Father, we're in this together, and I have shown them your character, who you are, and your Father. Your Father. And you're loving, and you're sovereign, and you care. And these, these are special objects of your, of your love. They were yours. You gave them to me. You see? And, 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 and they have kept your word, meaning that they have received it. What I have told them, they have received it. And that's what we all need, right? To receive the word of God. And to receive it deep into our being. It's not just like, oh, I have more intellectual knowledge about the Bible. No. To, to, to receive it and let it penetrate into our souls and make a difference in life. Making the, a difference in the way we speak, in the way we talk to others, decisions that we make. What, what, what are we passionate about? Are we passionate about the wrong things? And God says, no, I want you to be passionate. I want you to be passionate, but I want you to be passionate in the right things, the right values. You see? And that means that the Word of God penetrates and it makes a difference in our hearts. And that's what Jesus is saying. Father, I've revealed your name, your character, to these men that you gave me out of the world, and they have kept your word. See, uh, the mission for what I came, it's being done, it's accomplished, so to speak. So that's the introduction. And so now he kind of says more about that. Um, 
Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. What is he trying to say? God, Lord, Father, they've come to know that you and I are working together. And that you, everything that I've given to them, it comes from you, Father. You see. And that's very important again. Remember, Jesus is praying to the Father. He's praying, so in a sense, the disciples are hearing, but he also is kind of uh, uh, talking to the Father and saying, Lord, I, you know, Father, we're working together here. Right? And uh, they've come to know that... Everything that I've given to, given to me is from you. What you've given is come from you. And it's very important. Verse 8. For the words which you've given me, I have given to them. And they have received them and truly understood that I call, come forth from you. And they believe that you sent me. Now remember, uh, I've said before the word sent, S-E-N-T, or send, S-E-N-D, in the Gospel of John, is synonymous with the concrete expression of God's love. Right? So, what Jesus is saying is this. Father, not only are they, have they understood and received the truth that they, I have, we have this divine connection, that I, everything is from you, but also they have received your love. They have come to realize, you sent me, and I am the, ex the concrete expression of your love. And they have received that love. I don't know about you, but there are many, many times that I seek to love. Not even close to Jesus, right? But I seek to love someone. Giving them truth, guiding them. And when they reject, ah, there's an ache in my heart. But when I love and there's a reception of that love, yes, yes. And that's what Jesus is saying. Father, <laughs> not only have they come and received it, they, they know that everything I received is from you. We have this connection, but they have received the love you sent, which is me. It's awesome what Jesus is telling as he prays to the Father. They believe that you sent me, that I am the express, concrete expression of your love. You see? So, basically, what I came to do has been accomplished, Father, in them, you see. And that's, that's what he, he, he wants in all of us, right? But now he says, uh, now, Father, uh, you and I work, are in this together. You and I are in this together. And do you remember in the Psalms? We've been going over the Psalms on the Sunday mornings. And one of the things that come out in the Psalms is kind of like, really? That's the way you pray? In the Psalms, the psalmist, uh, uh, many times they give God reasons why God should answer the prayer. Remember that? Uh, well, you know, God, if you let me die, who's going to praise you from the grave? <laughs> so don't let me die! <laughs> so I can continue praising you. I mean, the psalmist gives God reasons to answer his prayer. And I think that's kind of what Jesus is doing here right now. Hey, Father, let me give you a reason why you should answer my prayer. And so now, verse 10, or 9 and 10. So in 9, he says, uh, I ask on, the, on their behalf. I do not ask on the behalf of the world, but of those whom you have, you have given to me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine. I have been glorified in them. You see? Father, I mean, we're in this together. So I'm praying for them and I, you know, answer my prayer because yours is mine and mine is yours. And, you know, I mean, Jesus is talking to the Father. He's praying. Remember, he's praying. Um, and not only are we working on this together, Father. In them, I am glorified. What does it mean by that? 
Uh, remember I used the illustration that, you know, when a woman uh, is pregnant, is going to give birth, uh, there's a glory that's there. Uh, every time my wife was pregnant and about to deliver, she, she just glorious. She just glowed. Why? Because it was befitting. It was right. This is the way she was designed to give life. And when a person does what they were designed for, they're glorified. You see? And so when the disciples respond to Jesus positively, that they receive the word, they receive the love of the Father through Jesus, yes! See? Jesus is glorified because the right effects are there. The right response is there. So Jesus is saying, Father, I want you to answer my prayer because, uh, well... What's yours is mine, and mine is yours. We're in this together. And number two, I'm glorified through them, Father. We're in this together. You see? So he's giving God the Father reasons why he should answer his prayer. <laughs> and now we're going to get into what he actually prays for. Right? Verse through, uh, 11 through 16. He says, um, first of all, uh, Father, I've been with them. But I'm leaving them. I'm leaving them. And so, you know, they're gonna, there's going to be a lot of temptations, Father. And I'm not going to be around. So, and you can imagine, remember, 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 the disciples were hearing what Jesus was praying. What are they hearing? They're hearing the care, the love that Jesus has for them, his concern for them. They're listening to the prayer as Jesus talked to the Father. So we pick it up then in verse 11. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. Hmm. I, and I come to you. I'm leaving them, Father. They're going to be staying in this guilty, dirty uh, a weak, sinful, temptation-filled, devil-filled world. I'm going to leave him here. And I'm going back to you. Perfection. Absolute holiness. Absolute bliss. Absolute protection. But they're staying here, Father. You see? The disciples are, ooh, man. Jesus really cares for us. And he understands us. He understands us. I'm leaving, but they're in the world. And now he gives his prayer, and look what he says. How does he actually start it? Holy Father. That is so beautiful. So beautiful. Holy Father. Holy Father, keep them in your name. What does that mean? Father, keep them in the sphere. Keep them within the realm of your holy character. Keep them in that nurturing environment of your presence, Father. Because I'm leaving and this world is crazy, hellish. And they're weak. Father, keep them in your name. Holy Father, keep them in your name. The name which you gave to me. And when they are in your presence, when they're in this fear, sphere, this this, this environment of your holy character, you know what? They are one. They are one. Father, like you and I are one. We are one. How many of us have come to know situations and friends that when we are in their presence, there's a certain safety. There's a certain peace because we know they have our back. 
Because we know that they are strong. And they can guide us. And, and we can trust them. Jesus is saying, Father, keep them in that realm in your name, in that sphere of holiness and protection. And when they're there, they're going to be united. We're going to be one, you see, with God. And that's what Jesus is praying for. So, Father, protect them in your name. Nourish them. Now he goes on. Verse 12. While I was with them, I kept them in your, in your name. There it is again. In your name. In that sphere of power and holiness which you gave to me and I guarded them and not one of them uh, perished but the son of perdition so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. Wow. We can get into the sovereignty of God there majorly. And God is absolutely sovereign and he knows who's going to keep and who he's not. And that can get some of us angry. But we're mere humans. God is God and we bow down to him but Jesus is saying while I was here father I kept them uh, you know so I, I, I'm praying now that, that that you're with them in a special way because I, I'm leaving uh, so he says um, verse 13 but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in them. I'm leaving but that so that they hear. And when they hear the truth, they have joy in them. Isn't that an amazing thing? Let me pause here. I was going to leave it to the application. and I might say it more, but I'm so excited. I got to say it now. I got to say it now. Look at this. What nourishes them? What, what, what fulfills their soul? Is it a new Cadillac? Is it a new house? Is it a new job? Is it a new bill of health? No, no. Look at it again. Verse 13. But now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have their... Uh, my joy made full in themselves. It's the word of God. You see that? It's the word of God that nourishes them and can bring them to joy. Oh, how different it is than what the world is trying to sell to us. No? In our own minds. We go off so quickly and, oh, that's what's going to make me happy. Oh, that's what's going to make me happy. And what about the word of God? I have given them your word, Lord. And I speak so that my joy will be made full in them. The truth, the truth, the truth, the truth, the truth. It can nourish our soul. And that's what Jesus is saying. I speak in this world so that they may, my, may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word. I mean, he spells it out, right? He spells it out again. I have given them your word. And the world hates them. Hmm. The world hates them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, let me skip over to verse 16 because he basically repeats the same thing. Right? And when God repeats something, it's not that he's stuttering, that he forgot something. He's making a point. Right? Verse 16, he basically repeats what he said in verse, the last part of verse 14. They are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. What are you saying then? Um, I have given you your word, and the world hates them, because they are not of this world. You know what that means? Uh, their source of nourishment, their source of life, is not what the world offers. And when the, you and I are not dependent on the world, the world doesn't like it. The world wants us to be dependent on them. 
Madison Avenue, all the advertising in all the world is so that we buy and buy and buy. Oh, we'll give you, a, you know, no interest for a whole year. Big old massive hook mm, into your flesh. You're mine, buddy. But when we say, no, the source of my life is the word of God. The world goes, rrr, rrr, rrr. they don't like it. That's what Jesus is saying. The world hates you because your source is not this world. Your source is my word. And they don't like it. You know how I know, Jesus says? Because I am not of this world. Because my source is not this world is God the Father, and they hate me for it. They hate me for it. That's what Jesus is saying. You see, verse 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, um, but to keep them from the evil one. So first he had praise, Father, keep them in the sphere of holiness. Keep them in the sphere of the power of your character. And away from evil. Because this world is full of evil. We can be nonchalant about it. Oh, just trust God. Yeah, yeah, just, you know, no big deal. Oh, my goodness, we're setting ourselves up where we're not realistic of the power of evil. Very powerful. And we must be very sober about it. But in that soberness, it's not about being fearful and all panicky. Oh, I can't go out of my house because I'm going to encounter a demon. No, no. Jesus is saying, it's not that I want you to take them out of the world, Father. I'm praying that you keep them in this fear. And I pray that you keep them Away from evil, apart from evil, separated from evil. Note, 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 Jesus was praying about that. That doesn't automatically mean that you and I are going to be out of evil because we still have our own wills. We can still choose against God. And God is a gentleman. God is not going to force anybody. You see, it's still us to say, yes, I want to come under. I want to be in the sphere, in the power of the character of God. You see, God help us. So here we find again, Jesus is hard for, for his disciples. He loves them. And, 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 and he, he's revealing himself as he prays to the Father. And he shares his joy with the Father. And then he prays for his disciples that you protect them, that you nourish them, God. Because the world's going to hate them. Because they're not dependent on the world. Um, and when we are not dependent on the world, you know what happens? Automatically. 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 We expose the world. We don't have to come down on them. We don't have to, you know, try to sh shove the Bible down their throat. No. Just don't be dependent on the world. Man, and it's like a floodlight bah, bah, on the darkness. And they don't like it. They might not say anything outright, but they don't like it. Satan doesn't like it either. Demons don't like it either. But we, when we become uh, weak and we fall into sin, we become dependent on them. And that's what they love. You see? So, let's look at a few applications. Number one, uh, the world is trying to sell us all kinds of lies that can sound good. They can sound really good, right? Follow your dreams. Uh, um, you've got everything you need. Just, you know, do it and you can do it, you know. Well, it sounds right and sounds good, 
And there is some truth to that. But here in this passage, there is a specialness to God's people. The people he chooses. And you find this, how Jesus talks about his own, about his disciples. Father, you gave them to me. They were yours, but you gave them to me. That doesn't mean everybody, because even the son of perdition was lost, right? But th these are special people that you gave to me. And then what's yours is mine, and what mine is yours. And who is that? These disciples, believers. There's a specialness. God, you have chosen certain people. Wow. Wow. <laughs> When we think about that, uh, you can think of it in many, many different ways. If you're in school and the teacher all of a sudden wants you to do a special thing, chooses one or two of you in your class, is like, ooh, pretty special here. We may not say it, but, you know, at work, a special award or, or you know, something, you can feel very special. Well, here Jesus is saying, these are the ones you gave, Father. This is the one you, you picked. And you're given to me. God chosen. And then, here's another specialty. We can be used of God to glorify Jesus. Isn't that what verse 10 says? In them I am glorified. You and I can be used to glorify God Almighty. We can glorify the one who nails wind through his hands for me and for you. We can glorify him. Oh my goodness. What a great purpose for living. You see? That we can honor him. That's being special. Special. And then, so that's number one. Be encouraged by that there's a specialness to us when God has chosen us. And that he can use us to glorify his son. But then um, we need to see Jesus' care for us, for his believers. Did you note, know I mean, I went over it, how Jesus really, really cares for his disciples. He's saying, Father, I'm leaving. And, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're going to be in a situation where I'm not going to be here. Now, he's already, talked about, he's already talked about sending the Holy Spirit. But here he's talking to the Father. Who's listening? Who's listening? The disciples. So I think Jesus is saying all these things so that his disciples will hear and be encouraged by that. And what's one of the things they're going to be encouraged? By the care that Jesus has for them. You see. And you and I need to realize how much Jesus cares for each and every one of us. He is very, very aware of every tear that we shed, every pain that we have, every lonely pain painful situation that we have. He knows about it. And he cares very much. Right? Verse 11. I'm no longer in the world, but they themselves are in the world, Father. Verse 15. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from evil. Father, protect them, nourish them, Father. Um, turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. Because, you know, again, many times we don't feel the love of the Father. We don't feel the love of God. And so we're not moved by it. We might know it intellectually. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. He really, really cares for you. Why? Verse 8. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That's the reality. You see? That's the reality. But the point is, Jesus really cares. For what are you going through in life? What does some loved one that you have going through life? Are they going through, do they have major wounds, major fears? They feel hopeless? Do you, from the bottom of your heart, can you really encourage them in the Lord? Not just spew out verses because you know the verses, but really from your heart, you can say, you know what? 
the Lord really, really cares for you. He's with you. You see? And here in John 17, Jesus says, I, I really care. He's, he's praying for his disciples. You see? So you and I need to cast our anxieties, our cares, on Jesus. He prays for his own. He's praying for the disciples. He prays for you and me. Other passages come to mind. We won't go there, but he prays for us. Do you know Jesus to really, really care for you? This passage shows that he does. Finally, my last application. I mean, what did Jesus say right off the bat in John 17, verse 6? I have manifested your name, and I have given them your word, right? Uh, right from uh, verse 8, and again in verse 14, I've given them your word. Um, this is the source of power and life. Our source of life is not what the world offers uh, but connection with God, the name, the character of his word. We must seek unity with God and the knowledge of God. It's a, it's a mysterious thing, right? Why? Because it's a non-physical thing. You know, I tell young people, well, you know, aren't you ever with a friend that they give you nothing but when you walk away, it's like, oh, I don't want to part from them. There's a good fellowship, something nourishing is mysterious, but it's non-physical. And that just happens within human beings. Can you imagine fel having this fellowship with God and being in His Word, this spiritual nourishment? And that's what we need. Say, Lord, okay, you've given me what my soul needs. You've given me what my non-physical part of me needs. Why, why, oh God, why do I neglect that? Why do I not spend more time with you? Why do I not spend more time in the word that nourishes my soul? Because we're driven by the physical. And that's why we need to come back to the word of God. And here in this passage, we come back to what Jesus was praying about. Jesus, Jesus was praying. I mean, some of us, I remember hearing my, 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 some of my, prof my professors in seminary. Man, we'd hear, I'd hear them pray, and I knew, I knew, man, this professor has been with God this morning, man. <laughs> and I was encouraged just by hearing them pray. Can you imagine hearing Jesus pray? <laughs> That's what this chapter is about Jesus praying to God the Father and he says Father they need your character they need your word keep them Father keep them and you and I need to connect with the Father we need to connect with Jesus through his word in prayer will we will we Jesus revealed his heart he says Father man we're working together it's a great joy and I really care for my disciples. Take care of them, Dad. Take care of them. So let my life be the proof, the proof of